11 out of the last 12 rounds. And take a look what he did last week in Akron. Tournament of Champions, he needed a mark, covers the 10 pin, and there's major title number 10. The best player I've ever seen in major championship competition. And this is some great company that he's a part of now. Is he's tied with the late great Earl Anthony and Pete Weber, but some of the other names on that list, Mike Albee, Walter Ray, Williams Jr., and Norm Duke. But Dave, make no mistake about it, Jason Belmonte has transcended the sport. Today we have not one, not two, but three two-handers on the telecast, and it's all because of Jason Belmonte. And he is standing by right now with Kimberly. Thanks, guys. I feel like myself, along with the nation, is having deja vu because for a second a week in a row, you're sitting at the number one seed with a chance at making history. So there's been a lot of talk about you this whole week. So how do you focus when there's so much hype around you and what you could accomplish today? Yeah, well, uh, every time I put my feet on these approaches, my, my mind is clear. I don't think about anything or anyone. I just think about the five steps that I'm about to do, the way that I'm going to throw the ball. And then when I come off the approach, then I can start thinking about other things. But I've got a job to do. That's all that's on my mind. And hopefully I can execute today properly and uh, the pins will be kind. All right, well, we will see you in the final match. Guys, we're going to send it back to you. I swear these two have had more airtime than Regis and Kathy Lee together. <laughs> so this is event six of the season. We started with 120. We're down to five. 18 games of qualifying to get to 24. Then match play. Then 42 games to get to the TV finals. And, of course, your top five advancing to stepladder finals. And we'll show you the results a little bit later on about players six through 24. The fro wigs are out in place. The first of our matches today featuring Kyle Troop and EJ Tackett, a rev rate special for you to get you out of the gate here in Columbus. And right behind him there, behind EJ Tackett as well, is Guppy Troop. And you'll see him throughout the match rooting on his son. take a look at the stepladder bracket. DJ Archer stands by to meet the winner of this, and Anthony Simonson, one of those two-handers that Randy mentioned, and then Jason Belmonte, and again, a chance for a million-dollar bonus for a 300 game. And now, speaking of rev rate, one of the one-handers here. He doesn't need the extra rev rate, believe me. But you can see the his ball left on that oil pattern as Tackett leaves one behind. A very then, unusual 10 pin that was left there. Normally it's a ringing 10 where the six, six pin flies around the 10 or the flat 10 where the six, six pin kind of lays in the right channel. That was neither one of those. What is going to be is a spare for Tackett. The pattern we have not seen a lot on the PBA Tour over the years came back to Columbus, the Dragon Pattern. Yes, the new pattern for the PBA Tour, but this outside part of the lane is out of bounds. Players get the ball into that area, the ball's going to slide forever. 45 feet in length. Keep in mind, folks, the lane is only 60 feet in length overall. So the players are using very aggressive equipment with snow chains for surface. <laughs> oh, jeez. Tackett actually got a Brooklyn strike out of that, but that's not going to win in this match if he keeps that up. That's one you sort of apologize for, like a net cord in tennis. Well, he knew this was left of target out of his hand, but there's so much oil in, in the middle part of the lane, it was actually able to hold the ball and keep it from missing the head pin running away to the left. E.J. Tackett said... The key this week on this long oil pattern, slower ball speed. Now that was a weird leaf, too, to see the two pins sort of explode almost over those two. Yeah, that's called the fast eight. Wow. So just a little bit high, but both the four and the seven are left instead of just the four pin. That great knee bend at the foul line from Kyle Troop. And much like a major championship in golf, where par can be a good score, make your spares today if you'd like to grab this major on this 
dragon pattern. I, I'm not disagreeing with you, but if this oil pattern breaks down correctly, meaning the players dry up the right part of the lane, and then they migrate towards the middle where the heaviest concentration of oil is, I think we could see a lot of strikes today. Remember the blue line is the last good strike. The red line is the current shot. And that light hit doesn't work out. And that sleeper back there makes this one a little bit more difficult. Yeah, you're right. It, it, it really does. It, the strike track comes to us from our good friends at Kegel. Inspecto, Brent Sims, and Bob Ford bringing us all that great information week in and week out. But now you're right, the 248, 77% of the time is converted. That is the tour average. So the second major of the calendar for these PBA stars. Oh, that was pretty good. Right, and Steve Belmo won the TFC last week in Ohio. We've got the World Championship in March. No fooling. The USBC Masters on April 1st. And then right before Halloween, the U.S. Open. How would you define a major, Randy? Well, uh, the majors are what defines a career. And it's, uh, it's what all the greats gear up for. There's only five of them a year. <laughs> The flesh hit there for EJ Pat. Majors are synonymous with mentally grueling, physically grueling, the amount of games, the difficulty of the oil pattern. It's just a, a unique event, and uh, you can't even group them in the same category as a regular event. It, 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 the ma just the feeling of walking into the center knowing that there's a major starting uh, at the uh, beginning of the week the practice that goes into it, it, it's it's what it's what every player dreams of of uh, putting on their resume EJ Tackett's done it twice in his career already 12 titles in his career three last year he's only 26 years old <laughs> Creeping in from the side to erase the sting of the ringer. Now, this is a great break for EJ for a change. He gets the pin to roll across and take the ring 10 out. The six pin already went around the 10. It was gone. He got a little help from his friends. That shot deserved the help, quite honestly. That was flush. A troop down early. And he gets a sweep. On the 10 to thrust himself back into this. And there's his dad, one of the legends, one of the style legends of the PBA. We've got a little footage of Guppy that you're gonna uh, you, you're gonna understand where Kyle got his fashion sense. Kimberly, you understand though that Kyle's not 100 percent healthy. No, he is not. So Kyle almost missed his chance at making the TV finals because early on in match play on Friday, he started to get a sharp pain in his right hand and he could barely close it. So I asked him today how it's doing. He said it's better because on the day off he iced it, but it's still pretty tight. But he said he is looking forward to the adrenaline show again. So he doesn't feel the pain anymore. What he has is he, he pulled the tendon in his ring finger. So that that ring finger that sits in that finger hole, there's a, there's a tendon. When you put too much pressure on that tendon, it'll start to pull. It'll go all the way up, up the hand. I've actually seen players pull a tendon where it went all the way to the elbow. Ooh. That's exactly what Kyle's got, and there's only one way to cure it. It's rest and time off. So that sounds like a fairly common it, problem. It's happened a lot. It, it used to happen a lot more in the 80s and 90s because we used to grab the finger holes a lot more than the players do today. Well, he uh, continued to a bowling for EJ Tackett. You can see those lines, red and blue, married. Four in a row for Tackett. Yeah, he's splitting boards on the right lane. And real good shape now. 10 pin in the first, followed by a four bagger. And his speed control has been epic within a half a mile of an hour of every shot. Last week we saw him in about the 19 mile an hour range, this week 17. 
And that's because the longer oil pattern, the lanes are slicker, more ice on the pavement. He's got to throw it slower to get his ball to react. And it came in just a little bit through the face. He told us it felt unusual, and he described it by speaking slowly because he felt that, that was the best way to get his point across and how much he had to change his ball speed. Well, it, uh, typically what players will do is they'll just kind of sink their mind and body to what they're trying to do with a bowling ball. So if it's throwing it slower, they'll walk slower, they'll talk slower, their mannerisms, everything's slower and vice versa. And that's what we saw with EJ this week. It also speaks to his talent and his ability to adjust his game. Not everybody can do that. And man, not everybody should do that when it comes to converting that spare. EJ Tackett, though, has the advantage. DBA on Fox, sponsored by Go Bowling. For promotional offers, tips to improve your game, news, or to locate a bowling center near you, log on to GoBowling.com. Something else that's critical today, because you're getting triple points, is... PBA playoff the top 24 qualify for this and we've got everybody here just about except for DJ Archer Jason Belmonte has got a sizable lead on EJ Tackett and there you see pages 11 through 20 DJ Archer number 13 Chris Barnes had a good week this week he made a move up into 15 the top 24 will get an opportunity this is presented to you by the way by our friends at Volvo and right now the cutoff line is Kyle Sherman with Darren Tang and Patrick Jihad right there. Zach Wilkins was in the final 24 this week. Tom Smallwood there as well. So there's a lot going on here today, but the focus at the moment is on these two bowlers, Kyle Troop and EJ Tackett. The wee Iceman, Norm Duke in 30th, hanging around. He never goes away, and we don't want him to. Nope. <laughs> well, now, there's a couple of guys who went at it in 1984 on the Budweiser Classic. Yeah, you want to know where Kyle got his fashion sense? Wayne Webb's not enjoying this, and our apologies to our host, Randy, but Guppy needed the double in the semifinals. And he did. In fact, he struck out. Or as you would say, Randy, took it off the sheet from the fifth frame on yeah. and then beat the wee ice man. Yep. Yeah for his seventh career title. That's perfect. What a beautiful shot there. It's a slow start, but it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And right now, we have a one-pin match through six and a half frames. We had the national anthem sung earlier beautifully, by the way, and I actually, in, by accident, faced Wayne first before I found the flag. It's just easier with his outfits. I figure I can't go wrong. <laughs> the simple things in life. DJ oh, yeah! Tech coming in a long way. He was near that out of bounds area that you referenced earlier. Man. Well, let's take a look at what makes EJ Tackett so good. And I think a lot of it is his footwork, but it's his beautiful arm swing. Notice how the swing comes out away from him, and I want you to watch what he does on the way down. Go ahead and run it, guys. Look at how it tucks to the inside of that down line, and that enables him to get his hand and wrist in a perfect position to create all that power. That's my boys. Well, they are racking up the strike, so after a little bit of a tentative start, this match, Tackett did have a 23-pin lead. It's down to one. Decide that he can and he continues. Well, EJ Tackett knows how to win majors. And when you talk about majors, how about a Tiger Woods reference? When they talk about Tiger Woods, they don't talk about how many wins he has. They talk about how many major wins he has and how close he's getting to Jack Nich Nicholas. Jack Nicholas's major wins. Jack's got 18. Tiger's got 14. That's the defining moment. When you're a player and you can talk about how many majors you've won. That's really all that matters. Kyle Troop looking for his first. Again, that flush didn't have to be. And 
trip isn't going anywhere. And he's going to ask for a re-rack. None of these strikes have been pick-worthy yet, but you know he's got a pick in the pocket. The WBC Super Middleweight title fight is on FS1. Former champion and number one contender Anthony Durrell looks to reclaim the title as he battles the number two contender, Avni Ildurum, Saturday at 10 p.m. Eastern on FS1 and the Fox Sports app. This is for the lead. If there's one thing we've learned about watching Kyle Troop on TV, he's not afraid. He wants to make that big change, that big move in Lubbock in the 10th frame to win a match. Kyle Troop has the Maple Moxie. And that was a beautiful shot to take the lead for the first time in this match. Now the cameras love him. He loves the cameras. He's never going to be shy on television. And he's absolutely an adrenaline bowler. Now, E.J. Tackett's been magnificent, and he all of a sudden trails. This is a must-have strike. <laughs> Got to hurry. Oh, wide right. And there's out of bounds, as you said. So when I, when we talked about the oil pattern, and I illustrated that that part of the lane is out of bounds, that just hit black ice, or in our case, <sighs> blue ice, because it's really <laughs> slick out there. Yeah, it's the one part of the lane that even a great player can't overcome. That was almost an arrow right down lane. Now he's got to recover. He's got to be clean here in the ninth. Max for Tackett, 246. Troop, Max, 267. <clears throat> and if you thought the strike in the ninth was must strike, this is a must strike again for EJ Tackett. Kyle Troop has drained the last six. strike out we have a possibility of a tie because Kyle should step up and give a nine spare strike and we will tie at 246 apiece but no matter what EJ Tackett does in the 10th frame he cannot shut out Kyle Troop looking at one of the true stars on the PBA tour last few years especially 11 titles in the last three seasons. Stalking the pocket one more time, Tackett. Even Kyle Troop had to applaud that shot. The next one just as important. This next shot here, if he strikes, he will force Kyle Troop to strike on the first ball. Of course, that's how uh, Kyle Troop made the show. He was dueling Chris Barnes, who ended up finishing sixth, and Troop did the math and knew exactly how he had to finish and executed that finish perfectly to get past the Hall of Famer and get on the show. So EJ didn't like the way the pins looked down there, so he requested a re-rack. Sometimes players just use that to take a breath. Absolutely, or buying some time, or making Kyle Troop sit for a little bit. for E.J. Tackett, and believe it or not, it might not be enough. Well, now for Truth, he can go nine spare strike and win by one. That's how important that shot was. 
And there's EJ Tackett letting you know just how important it was. Remember, this is a major championship. He's got two to his credit. This young man, although has bowled on a major telecast before, has never won a major. And neither has the next bowler, DJ Archer, who was standing by to take on the winner. He found a strike that was pick worthy. Well, that was daddy lockups right there. <laughs> when that went through the pins and all 10 were in the pit, Kyle Troop knew that he was moving on to, to take on DJ Archer. up all in trouble and Kyle Troop has done it. Kyle Troop moving on against DJ Archer. Two players looking for their first majors. Face to face. We want to thank our friends at Clutch Bowling for providing us with their projection technology. Clutch Bowling is a brand new video projection system that combines vibrant graphics and motion tracking for a new kind of bowling experience. So when you see that trail on the ball, that is Clutch Bowling. And wigs and picks and <laughs> Kyle Troop fans have popped up everywhere. I love it. And Kyle Troop coming from behind to defeat two time major winner EJ Tackett. Kyle Troop 255 to 245. Look at that finish after a couple of spares in lane three, excuse me, in the frames two and three. Let's take a look now. Let's revisit our dragon oil pattern, what has happened so far. All right, so he here's where all the traffic is. You can see it's lighter there. And as this area dries out, the players are going to migrate this way because they're looking for more of that dark blue stuff. When it gets time for Belmonte to take the lanes, don't be surprised if you see him lofting it halfway to this point in the air to avoid the dry part of the lane. And there might not be anybody any better. Maybe Marshall Kent at actually lofting the ball. We can have you time for our Flow Bowling Tournament highlights. And speaking of Kyle Troop, he shot 300 in the last round of match play to help him solidify that fifth seed. Chris Barnes, man, boy, what a week he had. Everybody was rooting for him. A couple of bad breaks late. Chris finished six, but a great show and missed the show by 33. And then our defending champ, Tom Smallwood. He was in fifth going into position round, but struggled against Troop. He would end up in seventh. The big nasty West Milan, of course, the U.S. Open champion in Columbus, was eighth this week. Got a break on this strike, though, but didn't get enough of it to make the show. We mentioned Marshall Ken just a moment ago. Strong, strong player. He always shows up well in major championships. He finished in ninth place. Sean Rash is having a giant year so far in 2019. A top 10 finish for Sean. So competition began a few days ago. We take a look. Chris Barnes, by the way, he had some awful breaks in the final day of match play. He could have easily made this show. Tom Smallwood, who won it here last year, seventh. Tom Doherty had a strong performance. So does Zach Wilkins. Tommy Jones below Neil. Brad Miller's bowled very well lately, and he finished in the 15th spot. Yes, for Spenson. Hey, we finally found the left-hander. Well, Zach Wilkins, too. Yeah. But Stu Williams, A.J. Chapman, Thomas Larson, and, of course, uh, Oscar Palermo and his unbelievable effect on pins everywhere. And here you see... Our other four who made it into match play competition. Uh, 120 players to start. And now we're down to four. And here, uh, Danny James Archer, DJ Archer out of Spring, Texas. Two bowlers looking for their first major championship. One of them is going to get a little bit closer to it when that match comes up after this. And you're watching the PBA on FS1. That hair is magnificent today. 
And so was his performance in game one, defeating a two-time major champion E.J. Tackett. He'll take on D.J. Archer next. Meantime, coming up next on FS1, Seton Hall takes on Creighton and Phil Booth, number 13, Villanova. Face off with Shimori Pons and St. John's. Good to see the Red Storm looking better these days. A Big East doubleheader in FS1 and the Fox Sports app. That's coming up next. But right now, we have D.J. Archer and Kyle Troop in our second match. Anthony Simonson and Jason Belmonte are awaiting that. And of course, a million dollar bonus for 300 games from the PBA and Fox in the championship. And Jason Belmonte going for an 11th major and PBA history. But first, two players looking for major championship number one. Split in this match, and it's a nasty one. Good start. <laughs> and sarcastically applauded by Kyle Troop with the four six. Yeah, right through the nose, leaving the four and the six. Right. Not an easy one to make. You gotta slide it over just perfectly, and you have to throw really hard to get it to go all the way over into either the four or the six pin. So here is D.J. Archer out of Spring, Texas. Two career tour titles from the Houston area. And you notice something in warm-ups that he has already made an adjustment to his game. Well, it, it looks like he was going with just a little bit more loft, but I, I spoke with uh, his tour roommate, Tommy Jones, who said, nah, it's not normal. And he, too, went through the face. And leaves behind 3-6-10. That's pretty terrible. Well, I talked about in the old pattern that we might see Jason Belmonte lofting a little bit once he gets deep enough because he has to to avoid hitting that left gutter cap. But here we see DJ Archer doing it. And he'll take that out side to side to side. 80% conversion chance for DJ Archer. Might be battling a nerve or two. He's not a rookie on television by any means, particularly in doubles competition. He has been in the Roth Home and PBA doubles. TV shows three times. His last tour title was the South Shore Doubles with Bob Learn Jr. And he has a singles title in Las Vegas in 2014. He was sterling in match play with 18 wins out of 24 matches. Much better. It is much better. Now, what is the advantage he is gaining? by lofting or lopping that ball out there. Well, typically when a player lofts it, it's, it's to try to get the ball to to not hook. The ball can't hook when it's in the air. DJ, this okay. is just part of his style. He catches so much of it at the bottom of the swing that this keeps the ball from hooking early and helps him to get it down the lane because not only does he really get on it, it meaning power at the release point, but he also throws it slower. Sorts of trouble and gets a strike he had to have following the open of the first frame. For you folks at home watching, Kalchuk needs to make an adjustment now. Why? Because both shots in the first and second frame have drifted high. So what he needs to do is he needs to migrate towards the middle part of the lane where the heaviest concentration of oil is and then open up his angles a little bit, meaning get that ball to go a little bit more left to right and then back to the pocket. If you go high, you're basically going right at the head pin, and that can be disastrous even for the very best. Oh, and that's just unfair to see a nice shot with a ringing 10, with that six pin wrapping around the 10. Yeah, and you can tell by Kyle's reaction. He really liked that shot there, and this was just dirty. Look at the six just violently slingshot around the 10 pin. The six pin, the second pin to the right, and just inside the 10. 95% of the time, it works 100% of the time. To paraphrase Ron Burgundy, and Kyle Troop is able to handle that single pin spare. Actually, that wasn't Burgundy who said that. That was DJ Fontana. 
his buddy in Brian, Anchorman, Brian, Brian Fontana. Fontana. Yeah. DJ Fontana, you're thinking of DJ Archer. I like Brian. it. Yep. And Archer, we've seen that one left already today by Kyle Troop at 2 4 8. And that 8 pin back there called a sleeper it can be tricky. Gotta take a look at DJ Archer's style. Very forward with the upper body lean. I mean, look at that. That's just <laughs> incredible how forward he is. Typically, we see that with players that throw with two hands. Turn and will. DJ loves the long roll patterns. It, it enables him to do what he does best, which is play the deep inside part of the lane. He's playing a lot of angle right now, plus he likes to throw it slow. This gets him to be right in his wheelhouse. Now all he has to do is execute as we take a look at his arsenal physics. The higher the number, the more hook. And much like in golf, you know, when you have certain golf courses that just look good to the eye for players. Absolutely. It's the same thing with oil patterns right. and bowling. And you could look at the, the dullness of that bowling ball. That just shows you how rough the surface is and how much surface the players are using on this extremely long pattern. DJ Archer picks up the strike in the fourth. That gives us a chance to check in with Kimberly Pressler. Thanks, guys. So, EJ, let's talk about that ninth frame when your ball went wide. Yeah, it was just a, a bad shot. It was it was my miss this week. I was trying to throw the ball so slow, and about once a game, my hand would just go around it. Well, put your analyst hat on for a second here and tell me what's happening with the lanes. Well, they're breaking down pretty good. The, the oil is pretty thin on the lane. Um, this pattern's pretty long, so the oil's spread out pretty thin, and as it breaks down, the guys are just going to move farther and farther left and uh, try to use a little more rotation on their bowling ball and keep their speed really slow. That was the keys to success this week on this pattern. All right, thank you so much for your time. Well, just like I, I, I said, every time we visit the oil patterns, we take a look at the messenger coming to take out the 10 pin. But that's what the players do. And even though the pattern's really long, a little bit thin up front with the hot lights here on the televised finals pair, that front part of the lane starts to break down pretty quick. So what the players do is they move farther left, and then they start to take to the air. Kyle Choup not there yet, but... He's capable of lofting the ball as well. Now he is on that left lane that he has not struck on yet in this game. Until now, and he buried it. Absolutely perfect. That makes the troops force him down there pretty happy. And back and forth we go. Archer's lead down to one here midway through the match. Archer, a national champion, uh, West Texas A&M bowling team. Fourth in the 04 UBC Masters, his highest performance in a major to date. He's got to hurry, and he has a 2 4 10. The location was bad, it was too far right, and kind of got to that real slick part of the lane. So tight. Outside, you see how far right it gets? Now, he just said that thing is so tight, obviously referring to the lane. What does he mean by a tight lane? Slick, oily, icy, no friction. Going for it. No. He's trying to kick that two over, and suddenly Archer had that one pin leading on trails by 13 through 5. <laughs> Come on. I just felt the location was bad down lane. Too far to the right. And Troop will be moving to his to the right lane where he has struck both times so far. So this is a big shot right here. Put apart the eight and the nine. And DJ Archer recovered the only way he could have with a strike to stay alive in this battle with Kyle Troop, two players. What kind of world do you want to live in? I want to bring families closer together. I want to bring pride back to our communities. I want people to wear what they want. I want us to be free to talk about mental health. I want humanity to reconnect with nature. 
I want Sustainable to be the solution, not the alternative. Make the world you want. You've got the power, we've got the tools. Halfway through our second match of the day here in Columbus at the PBA Players Championship. And Randy, let's take a look at our summary through Strike Track. Well, I'll tell you what, the accuracy of Kyle Troop halfway through this match is incredible. I mean, he's literally spot on just about every shot within a half an inch of one another. And that's why Kyle Troop has a lead. He's keeping the ball in play, making the right adjustments, and then chasing that pattern excuse me that oil pattern that's breaking down he continues to migrate in and follow the oil to the inside part of the lane so you're wondering this is a major championship this is an incredibly important tournament for these players so naturally kyle troop intensely focused no he's not he's over there his mom is over there with the four troop guys who have got the fro wigs going and that's mom right there next to the guy with the hulk hands that's sherry troop so, and Kyle is listening to something on his phone, and of course there's Guppy with Wayne Webb, who's now developed the Afro wig, <laughs> which wasn't far off from the hair he had on the clip we showed earlier today. So yeah, it's, um, he goes, okay, now I gotta get to work. I feel like I'm at Woodstock. <laughs> and don't take the brown acid. Just be careful of that. shot right there through the face but there was so much time in between shots for Kyle Troop that's not always uh, an easy thing to do to throw a shot out of a break yeah we always used to, uh, used to call it the dreaded commercial break because as players we get into a rhythm and and then when you have to sit for a, a spell it's usually not a good thing and and that shot there was definitely left of target for Kyle Troop he'll try to put that in the pocket and he misses I mean Belmo said I was gonna chop that so. At least it is. <laughs> well, only 20% of the time does a pro miss a 3 6 10 on PBA Tour. Couldn't have happened at a worse time, in my opinion, working on a double. He could have increased his lead to 23. Instead, he's trailing now. And lets DJ Archer right back in the match. Archer's going to have to do something about that right lane, though, and that's what he's going to be up on next. Oh, Meantime, Troop again high, and he is going to catch a gigantic break. Well, that break there was heaven sent because back-to-back -back opens would have been disastrous for Kyle Troop. Anthony Simonson is awaiting the winner of this match. Jason Belmonte after that. Belmont going for major number 11 today. Oh, that will of Kyle's nerves if he had him a little bit. You know, there's such a thing as being too loose. Those definitely weren't my best shots. And uh, I think it was always... That, that one was, the one on the right leg was... I think you got to give it away a little bit. You didn't give it away a little bit. Let's start with the X? Yeah. Okay. One more move. Just a little bit more. Okay. I'll get to that in just a second. After DJ Archer on the right lane where he's done nothing better than seven. Spare or open. And he made whatever adjustment had to be made and comes through flush. Yeah. And all of a sudden, DJ has a 12 pin advantage, taking advantage of the open frame by Kyle Troop. Tim Mack was talking to Kyle. Tim Mack being the tour consultant uh, for Kyle Troop. And he was telling him to chase it in and give it away, meaning move farther left, open up your angles more, and give the ball some more room to the right. Of course, Tim, a very distinguished player in his own right. And great to see him out here. He's had multiple knee surgeries, had to take some time off. And great that he is here with us. He had his arm in the air, thought he had it. And ended up with a soft 10. That ball a little late coming around the corner and finishing just slightly behind the head pin, leaving that soft 10. 
Let's spare here. He'll still have an 11-pin lead. 95% of the time, tour average. The pros make that. Well, he knows he had an opportunity to really ruin the troop there for the strike, and he just did not get it, and he even thought he had it. Absolutely, he sure did. He, he was in great position to really put his foot on the throat of Kyle Troop. Now, Kyle needs to get back on the strike train. And you see the, how close they were, they are, in max scores. Just one pin difference. And Troop in that 300, it was in qualifying match play. And got him back in when he was looking like he wasn't going to make the show. That 300 really got him going, and perhaps that strike would get him going as well. And remember how long this pattern is at 45 feet. The players were hesitant to open up their angles too much for fear of the ball doing this, going light. So that's why the players threw it slow. Once they moved in and they opened up their angles, they had to throw it slow enough to get the ball to come around the corner and actually face the pocket. Well, it's a nice recovery because he had a couple of shaky frames. And you get two re-racks per game. Kyle has taken one of his. And again, if you're not familiar with that, a re-rack is just a reset of the pin. Sometimes the players don't like the look. And sometimes, quite honestly, it's the same thing as a 30-second timeout in basketball. what I just said. Yes, it was. You're right. Tommy Jones sitting uh, right behind us in the booth, just kind of getting a better vantage point. He said there's no place to sit, so he <laughs> decided to join us. When I was explaining what Kyle was trying to do, he said to me, nobody better at doing that than Jason Belmonte. In other words, nobody better than shaping it the way I just described. Yeah. That's why he is the number one seed and the top player in the world at the moment. It has been for a few years. So this match will clearly come down to the very end here with Archer up 11 in the foundation frame, the ninth. Let's see what he can do. 215 max score for DJ Archer. 194 max score for Kyle Troop. Goalposts down. 10 pin remaining. Split second there. He had that horror of a 7-10 staring back at him before the seven was cleared away. Yeah, this got ugly for a second. A spare here, two in, in two strikes in the tenth frame, and DJ Archer will advance to take on Anthony Simonson. Remember triple points here from this major. Well, the good news for him here, Randy, is he'll finish on the left lane where he has struck the second, fourth, sixth frames and left a nine spare in the eighth. Yeah, he left that little soft ten the last time up on the left lane. So, Taking his time. Yeah, Kyle Troop can maybe in a position where he can't do anything here. DJ Archer will dictate this match. Stop in the middle. Well, guess what? Kyle Troop's not done yet. <sighs> nope. Nope. Absolutely not now. Spare here and a strike. Kyle Troop needs to strike out to win by one. First things first. We've showed you a few times already the 95% conversion rate, but I'd love to have it broken down to in the 10th frame of a critical match conversion rate, but no problem for the veteran out Dave, of Texas. Dave, Kurt, re-rack. And he wants a re-rack. Yeah. It's a great idea. Ah, bad shot, D. Come on. Last three shots for DJ on, Archer, all 10 pins. Come on. Come on. Come on. If he right. strikes on this ball, he will force Kyle Troop to get all three strikes in the 10th frame to beat him. If he goes two strikes and nine, we'll have a one ball roll off. But again, that depends on this shot here.
reluctant to kick this side. Did he throw that a little harder? It, it just, it just <laughs> faced the pocket perfectly. It almost went right by the nine fit. But let me just say this. Roll. To a bowler psyche, needing three strikes in the tenth frame, a heck of a lot harder than needing two strikes in nine. If he gets nine there, that's exactly... Th that's why that strike is so big. That strike with the fell shot is huge. Now he has to have all three to win. Well, it's lane. He's done well so far. He struck three times. Oh, he didn't God. like it. He didn't like it. He got a break. Well, we saw EJ Tackett get a Brooklyn strike last week to advance. He had a Brooklyn strike today. He had a Brooklyn strike today, but he didn't advance. He did it against Josh Blanchard last week. And as a player, you never want to win that way. <sighs> better than that. So again, he must throw another strike right here. Come on, man. One more, and he will move on to face Anthony Simonson. Nine, and we'll have a one-ball roll-off. Less than nine, and DJ Archer will advance to the next match. He will take another re-rack. Well, he needs to throw it on that same exact line and about a half a mile an hour slower to give the ball time to get around the corner and face the one three pocket a little more flush. Right here. That's one you got. Being a sports parent is more difficult than being the athlete. And nobody knows it better than that man, an eight-time champion on the tour or the fine gentleman sitting next to him, Lane Webb, a 20-time winner. They know what Kyle Troop is like. Strike to win. Then he came back with probably his best shot of the match to win by one. Kyle Troop moving on. So in 2013 in North Brunswick, New Jersey, Jason Belmonte won the first of his USBC Masters titles. He was the tournament leader and defeated West Milan in a high-scoring affair, 258 to 245. 2017 in Las Vegas, nearly perfect. Beat Michael Tang, 279 to 212 to capture his fourth Masters championship. Now, we had 120 players to begin here at Wayne Webb's Columbus Bowl. They had to bowl 42 games to cut it down to five. And now we are down to three, and they're all two-handers. It'll be Kyle Troop, the number five seed, who has defeated E.J. Tackett and D.J. Archer. He's done with initials. Now it's Anthony Simonson and then Jason Belmonte to meet the winner. And let's bring in my partner, Randy Peterson, with today's track technique. Yeah, why not do it on the three two-handers? Even though they throw with two hands, they all look completely different. Kyle Troop takes really long steps. Uh, getting to the foul line, I want you to look at his spine angle when he gets there. Simonson's head dips, then he gets much flatter. And then there's Belmonte. Watch how much straighter up and down he is. But the one thing they all have in common, well, it's the position of the backswing and how they hold the bowling ball right before they deliver it into the foul line. Well, Kyle Troop. Am I starting? The answer is, are you starting? It certainly looks like it. A couple of real good guys on the tour, too. These two, Kyle Troop, Anthony Simonson. Kyle at 27 years old. There is Anthony at 22. He owns a major championship. Kyle looking for number one. This is the second of major of the majors on the PBA calendar. You saw one last week with Jason Belmonte winning the Tournament of Champions. The stakes are higher. The points are higher. 
Everything is just elevated, and you can sense it when you walk in. Kyle Chup going with a ball change. Ross again. He goes Brooklyn, crosses that Brooklyn bridge, and gets his strike. Why do you think he changed? Well, I don't know. He, he changed from an asymmetrical ball to a symmetrical ball. So he, he went to a ball that has a smaller engine in it. And I'm thinking that the reason why is so that he could get some more down lane reaction. Something that's okay. a little bit cleaner through the front will store energy longer and then come around the corner a little bit harder. I'm pretty sure that's why he went to that. And Anthony Simonson just buries 10 alive in the pit. Anthony won two times last year in Middletown, Delaware, and Owasso. I wish these guys were more nervous. <laughs> they are just they're they just hiding it with humor. Yeah. Simonson's playing the lane is completely different. And he said in his interview yesterday that he was going to do that. Mm -hmm. He said, if it's there, I'm going to play right of everybody else. I'll have that part of the lane to myself. Absolutely. Two. Solid start for Simonson. Went up and top there. Watch his eyes right before he lets go. They look right down at the foul line. That's where he targets. That's pretty straight. He's using speed to keep the ball on line and throw it straighter. Not true. Second shot with a new ball and uh oh. So there's that back end reaction that I was telling you he was looking for, and that time he came up to bite him. Come on. Leave him the 3 4 7. Uh, all right, Randy, the question is, and that's an unusual lead, by the way, the 3 4 7. Do you consider that Kyle would go back to the old ball? And that, by the way, Randy's showing you the way to make this difficult shot, but would you consider him going back to the other one? No. Okay. Nope. Yeah, and and that's we don't have a percentage on the three four seven because it's rarely left. It's an unusual one to say the least. Yeah, no, Dave, to answer your question, I don't think he goes back to the ball that he was originally using. I think he goes to something else. You know, you're using one ball and, and you make a ball change. You don't go back to the original ball and play it safe. He's using an idle now. He was using a code X. He went to less hook. Come on. Change this. Oh, my goodness. The messenger shot out of a cannon. An air pick shot. Watch this ball go through the bins. And then look at this. Looks like a, a looks like the back part of the lane turned into a mosh pit. Wow. And you see, he's looking at his right hand, as was Kimberly reported earlier. Uh, Kyle is dealing with an injury with the ring finger of his right hand, a tendon most likely. And Simonson is just dealing with flushing pins into the pit every single time. And let's, uh, speaking of Kimberly, she's standing by with our tournament leader. I sure am, Dave. So, Jason, uh, two close matches, and there was a little lofting going on. Do you think that's something you'll be doing in the final match? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, the transition's happened now. You can see the guys have kind of eased into it after that second match. Uh, I think if the lanes get a little bit more drier in the front, you could see some of the guys move a little further left and get to loft in. But uh, in my little practice session back then, didn't need to. So uh, we'll see what the lanes say, and we'll make a decision then. And you have another crack at that million. Is that on the mind tonight? No, no, I'm not thinking about it today. Um, you know, if it uh, starts off well, great. If not, no worries. Right, well, thanks for your time. We'll let you get back to practice. Uh, Messenger's going to drop into the pit there. Belmo, thank you very much, and Kimberly as well. That was a great shot by Simonson as he was working on the front three strikes. Well, he's come out smoking right yeah. now. I mean, yeah. you know, he's had to wait a little while, and he was more than ready when this match started. Again, 95% tour average. I just think it's really interesting as to what he can do because I it, it again. really defies I logic. Really the oil pattern, the oil pattern breaks down, and typically all the players migrate towards the middle part of the lane. Simonson moved 
to the right. <laughs> Is it just because of the way he throws it, he it's, can get away with it? It's, it's what he can do to the bowling ball. So he can make the ball not read that part of the part of the lane, not create friction in that part of the lane. Kyle's eyes got really big as that ball approached the pin. So early on, he makes the ball change and has more shape, more back end reaction, more curve, more snap. It took him a couple of frames to see that Shot picture it. in his mind and then actually allow for a little bit more angle. He knew. And I'm sure he feels like he's back in this now, riding a double. This dude, is, his, pil his pillow is cool on both sides. <laughs> That's one thing we do know about Kyle Troop. <laughs> Nicknamed the Afro Fish. No. Uh, he, well, he is three for three with the long hit. It's still an X. Well, it, it won in the match last game against DJ Archer. And we'll have to wait and see what it does for with this match here. But it certainly gets him right back in it. I just wonder if his hand is bothering him a little bit, too. It, I think it's just a trust thing where he's, he's not real comfortable giving too much of the pocket away. Oh, man, for the first time, Anthony Simonson misses the pocket, and he did so rather badly. And he'll leave a one, two, four, eight. Well, I call this the wet bar of soap syndrome, where the ball just kind of comes shooting out of the player's hand with nothing on it. So it had no chance of grabbing the lane. Got to go through the absolutely ripped that eight pin out of there and he did it perfectly. And he's using phase two, so the, the middle of the three levels of hook. Again, the higher number equals more hook. Let's see if that last shot phases him on this next shot. A little better than the last one. Thank you, David Caruso. Yeah, CSI Miami? Yeah. And the only thing missing were the sunglasses. And then Roger Daltrey. There we go. That's the look we saw from Anthony Simonson when he showed up for this match. A violent strike. Yeah. Anthony Simonson has a major. He's the youngest to win a PBA major. He did it when he was 19 years and 39 days old when he won the USBC Masters. He's trying to double it output today. I'm Jason Belmonte. Number 10! 10! And you're watching the PBA on FS1. And you will see Jason in the next match here at Wayne Webb's Columbus Bowl in Ohio. And time for a look at strike track comparison. And our subject here is Kyle Troop. Yeah, and it's all about where he started and where he is now location-wise at the arrows. You can see the 19th board. That's just one inch right of the middle arrow. That's where he started. Look where he is now. Good six boards to the left. Break point still the same. He's made a ball change, and so the entire shape of what he's trying to create is different now because the lanes have transitioned. The front part of the lane is dried up, and that's forcing the players in. So Kyle Troop down nine, but riding three in a row. It's Anthony Simonson. All two-handers from here on in. The max scores reflect just a one-pin difference, 266, 265, if they strike out. This is for the lead, Dave. Let's go! He's got it. Earlier, we noticed a couple of times he was staring at that ring finger, Kimberly. Uh, you had a chance to get an update? I did. I spoke with him, and he said during the break, um, Kyle spoke with his ball rep, Jim Callahan, and said his right hand is now shooting pain up his ring finger since that last shot on the left hand. So he talked about making sure he does not hit up on the ball, but make sure the ball rolls off his hand. Yeah, so basically he, he's not really able to manhandle it at the bottom. You know, Kyle Troop 
and and the two handers one of the one of their assets is power mm -hmm. and uh, he said you know what uh, I, i've got to back off on on that a little bit to keep my finger from exploding <laughs> He did not get the messenger that time that he had had a couple of those earlier. He doesn't mind making the pins explode. And as Randy mentioned earlier, the only thing that Kyle can do in that situation, as far as his hand goes, is just rest. And uh, he doesn't want to rest for the next 35 minutes or so. Really? <laughs> that was a good timing on that. Oh, well, he made it. That's all that matters. Yeah. yeah. The light, and it's just called four, the ball path line went off in like my third set. If we can cut that off earlier. So distracted a little bit with Troop on that, but he still made the shot. Mentioned uh, on the way into break, Anthony Simonson, what he did when he was 19 years old in 2016. So that same year, he won the Roth Holman doubles as part of then Connor Pickford. And just marching down the lane to another strike for Simonson. Well, head to PBA.com and check out the latest PBA Bowling Challenge mobile game for iPhone, iPad, and Android devices. More than 23 million people have downloaded the popular game, which is constantly updated with new ball options, venues, competitions, and challenges and features in-game rewards. Click on the PBA Bowling Challenge mobile game link at pba.com and get started today. Along with Randy Peterson and Kimberly Pressler, I'm Dave Lamont. Rob Stone has this weekend off. You see your max scores here. Simonson now 265, Troop down to 245. Again, just the pin punishment that Simonson is dishing out here gives him a 20-pin advantage as we start to wind this match down. Really incredible what, what he's doing to this oil pattern, how he's attacking the lanes. When everything else is telling me, no, you have to be farther left, you have to get away from that part of the lane because there's too much friction there and your ball's just going to read early and hook early and it's going to be disastrous. And look what Simonson's doing. Three-bagger, spare, spare, three-bagger. Oh. Got to go. Well, I can tell you for a fact, the last time oh, the 810 was made on television. It wasn't that long ago. <laughs> yeah, last week. He's just going to fire at it right away. And then he's going to only take one. I bet that hand hurts a little bit more now. Yeah, well, I wonder how much is Kyle's hand. Uh, and then Kyle losing a little bit of his ball reaction. A buzzsaw, third game again. Job. And what is he referring to there? The last time he was with us on television, we were in Lubbock, Texas, and Kyle was starting to run the ladder, got to the yeah. third step, and was defeated. Yeah, got ran over, and that's what that's what he's referring to as getting buzz sawed. Simonson doing the same thing. But you know what? A lot of that is on Simonson for coming out and just firing away right away. Wide again to the right. You know, so much about playing the oil patterns on tour is shaping the ball and, and Kyle just having trouble creating the proper shape. Some will probably ask, well, why didn't he play the lane straighter like Simonson did? Or like Simonson is doing? I don't know. Ask him. <laughs> well, <laughs> well does, it, it, he, he can do it too, right? Well, he's, he's capable of going straight, but that doesn't mean that he's going to get the same ball reaction right. as Anthony Simonson. I mean, their ball rolls are different. Their access points are different. Meantime, well, now there's, there you go. I didn't think that five pin was going to stay forever. Well, there's an old expression, straighter is greater. And we're actually seeing it here with Anthony Simonson to a degree as he has wrapped up this match and is setting up, as you see, a five pin take one for the team. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say you're not going to see Belmonte play the lanes this way. Well, I think it's pretty safe, yeah. I, he is standing by for major number 11. Anthony Simonson is looking for major number two. It's going to be a heavyweight two-hander match. 
Simonson and Belmo. Jason Belmonte looking for major championship number. Jason Belmonte to chase history. Let's go back to 2017, the PBA World Championships in Reno. And Jason Belmonte survived a roll off in the semis against Ryan Simonelli. And he won, defeating Jesper Svensson, 238-225. This is the only world championship title that man has right there. And that was major number nine of his career. He picked up number 10 a week ago in Fairlawn, Ohio. And now here he is against Anthony Simonson, the top two seeds out of the 120 players who began this event a few days ago, bowling for a major championship. Belmo's record setting 11th, Anthony Simonson's second. And right now, time for our Go Bowling with Randy segment. And my partner's gonna talk about how to make proper on-lane adjustments during a game. How to make proper on-lane adjustments? Wow, there's just so many adjustments uh, in today's modern game to be made. You can throw it faster, you can throw it slower, you can increase or decrease rev rate, you can change the surface of your bowling balls, you can change bowling balls. But generally, the rule of thumb is if you're missing the head pin to the right, move your feet and target to the right. If you're missing the head pin to the left, move your feet and target to the left. But the biggest problem I see with most amateurs and league bowlers is they start playing pretty straight between first and second arrow, and then as the lanes start to dry out, they move their feet but never move their target. They continually throw it into the driest part of the lane, and not only that, their angle increases massively to where they feel uncomfortable throwing the ball. Remember, the rule of thumb is, when the lane starts to change, move your feet and target together. All right, Randy, thank you very much. That's a great tip, especially the part about, you know, the feet but not the target. It, it, very typical where, where amateurs, they just keep keep moving their, their feet, never move their target. They look the driest part of the lane. Remember, move them together. That's what Belmonte does. That's what all the top pros do. Belmonte playing the inside part of the lane. Simonson's gonna go straight. Fascinating combination coming up. Two different styles. They're two-handers, but they're not the same. And Jason Belmonte or Anthony Simonson might win a million bucks. All you have to do is throw a 300. Brought to you by Go Bowling. For promotional offers, tips to improve your game, news, or to locate a bowling center near you, log on to GoBowling.com. And it's time for our Ebonite flashback. Taking a look back to the 2017 Players Championship right here at Wayne Webb's Columbus Bowl. That year, Jason Belmonte beat Anthony Simonson by 17 pins in the title match to win his 10 second career players championship that was one of three on the year for belmo and route to another pba player of the year award he's won that one four times back then that was major number seven so here we go 10 majors for belmo one for simonson 19 and 5 on titles of course belmo a little bit older in his mid-30s and 35 right now simonson just 22 already with five titles what was funny about that was the shaving cream on Belmonte's face because neither him nor Simonson ever <laughs> shaved. <laughs> well, Simonson actually reduced the size of yes. his beard as he suggested he would. No, no shaving is full removal. Yes, no, he yeah, did not no, do no, that. That's just a reduction. Like, he had a lumberjack beard yesterday. Yes, yes. Yeah. And he actually has a beard consultant that uh, helped him with that decision. Now he's how got... Have, how do you have a beard consultant? When you've won as many times as he has at this age, you have these spoils. <laughs> Coming. You could see that head pin oh. shoot off of that wall. Let me get some stuff. Let me get a few my way. All right. Playing in between third and fourth arrow. And going with that straighter shot. Now let's see what Belmonte's going to do. Remember the history on the line. Another major. He will stand alone on the top of Mount Major with 11. Right now he stands linked with Earl Anthony and Pete Weber. And Belmo did not loft there, but he did get a strike. And our Columbia 300 fun fact, if Jason Belmonte does win today, he would tie PBA Hall of Famers Amleto Monticelli, Dick Ritker, and Wayne Webb for 12th on the all-time PBA Tour wins list with 20. And that is Wayne Webb. 
and Elaine. And Elaine actually runs everything. El Elaine does all the work yep. here. Wayne just is, <laughs> is very busy being <laughs> Wayne. <laughs> and Wayne, when Wayne sees me, he'll, he'll agree with me. Yeah. I used to compete against Wayne back in the day, and, and uh, he was one of the best ever. Looks to be an absolutely perfect shot. From Wayne Webb and his glory years to this man who is by far the best on the planet. And that was a vicious ring and 10. Bill, Jason Belmonte looking to go back to back major victories. 4 1 all time against Simonson. By the way, Dave, the last player to win. Back-to-back -back majors on the PBA Tour. Let me guess. He just sat down. That is correct. <laughs> that was not the toughest trivia question I've ever had to deal with. <laughs> well, you know, I like to lob those softballs over the center of the plate for you. I need you to do that. I need him grooved. Yeah, it was 2014 Tournament of Champions and Masters. So you saw that these two faced off twice in match play, and they split. Just pumping him right down the middle. He's got some nice carry, too. 259 yep. game one, and that was only because he got a four count on his last ball. We call that the fill shot. Look at the right foot going sideways. That gets his hips open early. He said he was working on a little bit different setup to try to get a little more open and get the ball into the swing a little, a little more, with a little more freedom. But what's interesting, and you touched on it at the very beginning, the three two-handers on the show today, but Belmonte was the guy to do it first. Yeah. Here's a, somebody now 12, 13 years difference between these two. There's no question that Belmo had to have an influence on Simonson. Yeah, without question. Let's go! Ooh, no! No! That is not proper. Yeah, that's dirty. What a beautiful shot as the ball goes right past the nine pin. Watch this. A little too much power, a little too much drive, not enough deflection to catch that nine pin off balance. The ball just ghosted the nine pin. That's brutal. Well, let's, uh, Kimberly is standing by with Kyle Troop. Kimberly. Yes, I am. So, Kyle, uh, that match looked a little bit different than your previous one. Um, how much did your hurt hand play into this? Uh, my hand was actually feeling really good today uh, until the fifth frame against Simo. When I threw that second Brooklyn, it you know, uh, really, because I was having to catch on the pink ball just because the oil was getting down the lane, and and um, I couldn't really hit it after that. The last five frames, you know, that's why my ball really didn't want to hook too much. But uh, you know, Simo ball 260, this seems to be a trend. Two, week, two, week, two shows in a row. In the third game, I got 260 and 270 against me, so, uh, you know, it's a great week. I couldn't be any happier, and, uh, you know, I hope Simon wins it, because he's my boy. Are you bowling next week? And, uh, I'll wake up tomorrow and decide, because we'll see how it feels. <laughs> All right. As always, you look like you were having a great time out there. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, we love having Kyle on the show. He'll have Indianapolis next week, by the way, Sunday, the 24, 3 o'clock Eastern for that final of Woodland Bowl. And just hope it's not serious with his hand. Belmo broke up the 7-10. And, of course, makes a spare. With an early deficit, but certainly a manageable one. And he's right in the middle on that scale from 7 to 9.5 for the High Road Nano. Strike, ring 10, kind of that soft 10 in the third. Simonson off to the quick 10-pin lead after three frames. This time, the messenger is so often his friend okay. fails, hey, Belmo. So this is a, a ringing 10 where the six, so you're right, goes around the 10 and the seven stands. That is some of the the worst luck I've ever seen, and it happens a lot, especially to the power players. Not very often, but it does happen to them. And you saw the messenger head pin go in front of the 10. Three times we've seen it done on television. It's been a while, though. <laughs> Did not get there. And this, of course, will be a good opportunity to give you our hammer tough spare replay.
Vilma just doesn't throw it fast enough with a spare ball to bounce the pins out of the pit. Although he did make a 7-10 split just a couple of weeks ago. But not under the hot lights. Well, Anthony Simonson, you've been gifted a break. So many shots have looked like that from him today. It, it almost looks like he's spinning it through the front part of the lane so the ball doesn't read, it doesn't grab early. No friction being created early. And he's able to play that straighter line. He is throwing it faster than our other players, though, but he has to, to go that straight. I can't recall, and I'm not here every week, of course, but I can't recall such conversations from the players and from you about ball speed any more than I've heard in the last two days. First thing I saw when I got here watching the players was how slow everyone was throwing it. And that's what Simon said did. That's what he did early. But when he got into match play... Somebody's phone went off over here. When he got into match play, things changed, and he found this little trick where he could go a little bit straighter and kind of stay out of all of the traffic meaning everybody's playing in this part of the lane he could stay right of that that's brad miller on the left and pba commissioner tom clark on the right brad is the president of the pba players committee and had a very solid week too by the way finished in the top 25th the 15th another good week for brad we saw him on the doubles telecast a few weeks ago oh, no. so he hates it he has every reason to that is known as a greek church Come on, man. They ask you to do one thing when you get here, and that's turn your phones on silent. That's all they ask you to do. Turn your phone on silent. Well, unfortunately, it was uh, bad timing for that to happen, and I'm just going to say it was probably not intentional, but this is not a good break for Simo. This has a worse percentage conversion than the 710 by about half a percentage point. And all of a sudden, one fucking thing asked you to do. We apologize for that. A little bit of language there, but Simonson is understandably frustrated. And the one guy you don't want to give any freebies to, the one guy is right there. straight with your thing in between second and third arrow. now he's playing 25 board there it is actually that's 27 at the arrows that's the versatility of Jason Belmonte and that's what makes him so great that plus I think he's got one of the most brilliant minds on the tour yeah his ability to adjust on the fly is one of his secrets and it's a secret he guards. He doesn't divulge his adjustment secrets. Yeah, he saw it in his face. He knew the second he threw it, he knew that he had another good one. This time he gets 10 straight back, and now Simonson's down the three, and he's got to emotionally recover from that bad fifth frame. Just a brilliant shot by Belmonte taking advantage of the open frame. And you look, go back and look at Belmonte's start to this game. Ring 10, shaker 10, and then that awful pocket 7-10. Belmonte could have had the first six strikes easily. recovery he is three for three on that lane and it's on for the pba players championship you know when, when you talk about versatility simonson's no stranger to that either mm -hmm. i've seen him throw it halfway down the lane i've seen him throw it straight up first first arrow and everything in between and you have to be versatile to be able to compete at this level the max score favors Belmo at the moment as he goes for his 11th major championship that would make him the all-time major championship leader. Oh, my. He didn't sound happy, but he ought to be happy. By the way, Anthony Simonson pulls this out. He would be the youngest to, to own two majors.
birthday. He just had one a month ago, January 6, 1997. Belmo's won those the last two the PBA Players Championship and then the Roth Holman doubles with Bill O'Neill. on that bowling ball I Catch, don't know. catches just enough of the one three how did that make it to the puck looked like it should be ticketed for illegal left turn without using a signal man I mean the thing just went sideways like somebody kicked it now Belmonte working on three in a row can increase his lead to 13 how about you Simonson down 13. We are giving you this match without commercial interruption. Simonson's working a double. He has five strikes in seven frames as you take a look at the long scoreboard. But that fifth frame may be the one that'll keep him up tonight because Belmo has gone straight through five through eight with strikes. And again, just buries them. Buries them. Well, he can take the lead with another one in the ninth frame, and I'll tell you what, there's a strike that Simonson wants. It's the one right here in the ninth that sets up the tenth frame. But no matter what, he cannot shut out Jason Belmonte. We have seen Kyle Troop strike out to win a match today. We may see one of these two players do that for this major championship. right back on Belmonte. You see the mutual admiration for each other there as Simonson comes off the lane. Four-bagger, unbelievable. What a great match. Hey. Come on! They're both riding four-baggers right now. Bello understands what Simonson's going through, and he appreciated it, and he appreciates the competition. He doesn't want to win this the easy way. He wants to win it the hard way. It seems like he can just will these shots to happen when he has to have them. I'm not sure he didn't get away with that shot, and I'll tell you why. Please do. The last shot, he came in extremely light, remember? Mm -hmm. That shot there looked like he got a little bit more hand in it Excuse and got it a little a inside a target, and I think it just held pocket. Just my opinion. He's going to take a re-rack. You get two per game, and this is what he needs to do. Two and eight. And he is on top of what Randy referred to earlier as Mount Major. Mount Major. Best I've ever seen in majors. I've seen and bowled against some of the best ever, Walter Ray and Weber and Duke. And well, he's top five in 23 of 46 majors that he has bowled in. And he's won 10 of those 46. That's obscene. Wait a minute! Wait a minute! You could see that he liked no, the no, shot. No, 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 no. Hey, I see the man double your age get twice in a row. Come Holy on. smokes! He's got a real true believer in the no. back trying to root him on, but I'll alert you all when Randy starts breathing again because I think his heart stopped. I I've never seen this before ever. Look at him, though. I, I, I looked at him, not the ball. And then it sets, sets in because the messenger fell short of the 10. And this place is in stunned silence. For my 39 years, I've never seen anything like that. I've seen pocket 710s be, before, but not like that. That's his second one. He's going to have to bang it. He can't get it done. Second one on the same lane. 
and he finishes with a 2-12. Holy smokes. Well, Anthony Simonson's got a mark. Sounds simple. We know otherwise. Remember Greek church in the fifth for Simonson. But I think this is his good lane. Yeah, that was the left lane. This is on the right, and he's riding four in a row, but you know what? Belmo was riding five in a row when he got a 7-10. And that will do it! Let's go! Give me one! Let me get one! Anthony Simonson is the youngest bowler in PBA history to win two major championships, and he has defeated... Thank y'all for coming. Thank y'all for coming. Jason Belmonte to do so in a rematch of 2017. This time, Simonson is your winner. Greater was greater. And Anthony Simonson. Again. Come on. 22 years old. Classic Dexter Vice. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. What an unbelievable match because you had to feel like both these guys were going to win. At one point, it looked inevitable for Belmo, and yet he caught the horrid break that we're going to show you one more time. Avert your eyes if you're easily made sick. He never missed the pocket. He could have shot 300, but he left two of these on the same lane, the left lane, and it cost him... His 11th major, unbelievable, those two pocket 7-10 hits. And Jason is with Kimberly right now. Jason, you guys were fighting that out, uh, that entire match, but you had two 7-10 splits on that left lane. What was happening with your carry? Yeah, I mean, I bowled some pretty good shots that game. Uh, the ball just wasn't quite going through the pins, obviously, the way that I would have liked. Um, but, you know, to credit to Anthony, stepped up when he had to, uh, especially when I had the lead, made me step up in the 10th and... That's what makes a champion is to, to throw the shots, to force the other guy to do it. So congratulations, Anthony. Thank you so much, Jason. Anthony, we just talked about how hard fought this match was. You know, and he had some high praises for you. Um, talk to me about what was happening on the lanes, because when everyone was going left, it looked like you were going right. Yeah, well, uh, once we got into match play this week, I kind of decided to kind of camp out a little to the right, uh, not really give the three pin away too much. And uh, it was fortunate enough to pull away some streaks. Uh, the fifth frame, little distraction. I just put that behind me. I knew I had a good ball reaction. Just had to make a couple good shots. And, uh, you know, two years ago when I bowled Belmont in the finals, he got the hits. Uh, this year it didn't go his way. To beat uh, one of the best bowlers in the world, I'm truly speechless. You are the youngest person ever to win two majors. Put in words how that feels. Uh, incredible. Uh, you know, I, I didn't really have any words when I won the Masters. And then to have number two. I, like I said, I'm really just speechless. <laughs> and you got to do it against Jason Belmonte, who everyone is thinking he's one of the best in the world. Yeah, uh, he's a guy that, you know, I, I've been bowling to in all my life. Once Jason got on the scene uh, and, you know, I saw somebody that, oh, you can do this, uh, you know, he's a big motivation for me. I want to be the best in the world. And, uh, you know, you got to start by beating him. Anyone you want to dedicate this to? Uh, I just want to thank a couple friends that came out and watched uh, the drive.